Today we return to the epic tale of Harry Potter, the hero for our times. This is book four and the turning point in the series where things begin to turn a little dark and frankly begin to bear a shocking resemblance to the world we're living in today. Episode one. Chapter One, The Riddle House. The villagers of Little Hangleton still called it the Riddle House, even though it had been many years since the Riddle family had lived there. It stood on a hill overlooking the village. Some of its windows boarded, tiles missing from its roof, and ivy spreading unchecked over its face. Once a fine-looking manor, and easily the largest and grandest building for miles around, the Riddle House was now damp, derelict, and unoccupied. The Little Hangletons all agreed that the old house was creepy. Half a century ago, something strange and horrible had happened there something that the older inhabitants of the village still liked to discuss when topics for gossip were scarce. The story had been picked over so many times and had been embroidered in so many places that nobody was quite sure what the truth was anymore. Every version of the tale, however, started in the same place. Fifty years before, at daybreak on a fine summer's morning, when the Riddle House had still been well-kept and impressive, and a maid had entered the drawing room to find all three riddles dead. The maid had run screaming down the hill into the village and roused as many people as she could, lying there with their eyes wide open, cold as ice, still in their dining things. The police were summoned, and the whole of Little Hangleton had seethed with shocked curiosity and ill-disguised excitement. Nobody wasted their breath pretending to feel very sad about the riddles, for they had been most unpopular. Elderly Mr. and Mrs. Riddle had been rich, snobbish, and rude, and their grown-up son Tom had been even more so. All the villagers cared about was the identity of their murderer. Plainly, three apparently healthy people did not all drop dead of natural causes on the same night. The hanged man, the village pub, did a roaring trade that night. The whole village had turned out to discuss the murders. They were rewarded for leaving their firesides when the riddle's cook arrived dramatically in their midst and announced to the suddenly silent pub that a man called Frank Bryce had just been arrested. Frank, cried several people, never. Frank Bryce was the riddle's gardener. He lived alone in a run-down cottage in the riddle house grounds. Frank had come back from the war with a very stiff leg and a great dislike of crowds and loud noises. He'd been working for the riddles ever since. There was a rush to buy the cook drinks and hear more details. Always thought he was odd, she told the eagerly listening villagers after her fourth sherry. Unfriendly like. I'm sure if I've offered him a cup of once, I've offered it a hundred times. Never wanted to mix, he didn't. Ah, now, said a woman at the bar. He had a hard war, Frank. He likes the quiet life. That's no reason to... Who well, set a key to the back door, then, barked the cook. There's been a spare key hanging in the gardener's cottage far back as I can remember. Nobody forced the door last night. No broken windows. All Frank had to do was creep up to the big house... While we was all sleeping, the villagers exchanged dark looks. But I always thought he had a nasty look about him right enough, grunted a man at the bar. Well, I turned him funny, if you ask me, said the landlord. Told you I would not to get on the wrong side of Frank, didn't I, Dot? said an excited woman in the corner. Horrible temper, said Dot, nodding fervently. I remember when he was a kid. 
By the following morning, hardly anyone in Little Hangleton doubted that Frank Bryce had killed the riddles. But over in the neighboring town of Great Hangleton, in the dark and dingy police station, Frank was stubbornly repeating again and again that he was innocent, that the only person he had seen near the house on the day of the riddles' deaths had been a teenage boy, a stranger, dark-haired and pale. Nobody else in the village had seen any such boy, and the police were quite sure that Frank had invented him. Then, just when things were looking very serious for Frank, the report on the Riddle's bodies came back and changed everything. The police had never read an odder report. A team of doctors had examined the bodies and had concluded that none of the Riddle's had been poisoned, stabbed, shot, strangled, suffocated, or, as far as they could tell, harmed at all. In fact, the report continued, in a tone of unmistakable bewilderment, the riddles all appeared to be in perfect health, apart from the fact that they were all dead. The doctors did note, as though determined to find something wrong with the bodies, that each of the riddles had a look of terror upon his or her face. But as the frustrated police said, who ever heard of three people being frightened to death? As there was no proof that the Riddles had been murdered at all, the police were forced to let Frank go. The Riddles were buried in the little Angleton churchyard, and their graves remained objects of curiosity for a while. To everyone's surprise, and amidst a cloud of suspicion, Frank Bryce returned to his cottage in the grounds of the Riddle House. As far as I'm concerned, he killed them, and I don't care what the police say, said Dot in The Hanged Man. And if he had any decency, he'd leave here, knowing as how we knows he did it. But Frank did not leave. He stayed to tend the garden for the next family who lived at the Riddle House, and then the next, for neither family stayed long. Perhaps it was partly because of Frank that each new owner said there was a nasty feeling about the place, which, in the absence of inhabitants, started to fall into disrepair. The wealthy man who owned the Riddle House these days neither lived there nor put it to any use. They said in the village that he kept it for tax reasons, though nobody was very clear what these might be. The wealthy owner continued to pay Frank to do the gardening, however. Frank was nearing his 77th birthday now, very deaf, his bad leg stiffer than ever, but he could be seen pottering around the flower beds in fine weather, even though the weeds were starting to creep up on him. Weeds were not the only thing Frank had to contend with, either. Boys from the village made a habit of throwing stones through the windows of the Riddle House. They rode their bicycles over the lawns Frank worked so hard to keep smooth. Once or twice, they broke into the old house for a dare. They knew that old Frank was devoted to the house and grounds, and it amused them to see him limping across the garden, brandishing his stick and yelling croakily at them. Frank, on his part, believed the boys tormented him because they, like their parents and grandparents, thought him a murderer. So when Frank awoke one night in August and saw something very odd up at the house, he merely assumed that the boys had gone one step further in their attempts to punish him. It was Frank's bad leg that woke him. It was paining him worse than ever in his old age. He got up and limped downstairs into the kitchen with the idea of refilling his hot water bottle to ease the stiffness in his knee. Standing at the sink, filling the kettle, he looked up at the riddle house and saw lights glimmering in its upper windows. Frank knew at once what was going on. The boys had broken into the house again, and judging by the flickering quality of the light, they had started a fire. Frank had no telephone, and in any case he had 
deeply mistrusted the police ever since they had taken him in for questioning about the Riddle's deaths. He put down the kettle at once, hurried back upstairs as fast as his bad leg would allow, and was soon back in his kitchen, fully dressed and removing a rusty old key from its hook by the door. He picked up his walking stick, which was propped against the wall, and set off into the night.